In today's video, I'm going to be breaking down how you as a coach can pick basketball players for your team, but if you're a player right now, let's say you're younger or whatever, and you're looking to make a team, this is definitely a video for you because now you're going to understand what some coaches, like myself, look for in players. So, number one, what do I look for? Well, at tryout, the first thing I'm looking at is, of course, ball handling skills, shooting, can they play defense? Because to me, if the other team can't score, then, of course, we're going to potentially win more games. So, I look at shooting, dribbling, and defense. Those are my three things that I look at off the bat. The other thing I look at is the fourth thing, which is actual physical attributes. So, for example, that kid who's tall, who has long arms, has a good chance of making my team because he's tall and he has long arms. Or even if he's shorter and he's got long arms, he's going to be a good defender. Longer arms equals bigger, better defenders. We learned this with the Toronto Raptors, and I've been doing this for all 10, 10 years that I've been coaching. So... Physical attributes is the fourth because, of course, skills mean everything and then physical attributes just mean what potentially that player could become. And then I, of course, talk to the parents. I talk to the players. I get to know them a little bit. I get to understand, hey, like this kid's a, a center. He has aspirations of being a point guard, which isn't bad because... Remember, we're in a, the day and age that everybody on the court needs to be able to dribble and shoot. So if a center wants to be a point guard, that's going to be a lot of fun to teach. And then you get to see their mindset. Is there a kid who is going out there and saying, I'm the best. Yeah, I'm going to be destroying you. I'm going to, oh yeah, head top, whatever. Those, those players sometimes can fit on teams to push them. It depends on the type of team that you're building. But those players are generally shit disturbers. And from there, uh, you may have some issues with team morale later on down the road. Uh, also, the players who like to hog the ball. Of course, there are types of players who will hog the ball just because they are maybe not very good passers. But there's other types of players who hog the ball because they legitimately think that they are the best player in the state or the country or whatever. And if they are literally that player who's the top in the state or the top in the province or whatever, then... At that point, you can understand why they ain't passing the ball. They're the best. But if this player is not the best and they're not passing the ball and they're jacking up threes from eight feet beyond the three-point line, that is a huge, huge red mark or whatever on their name, and I usually do, usually do not pick them. And I also then interview the parents, usually. In most cases, I interview the parents. And... I'll go up to him and say, hey, how's it going? What do you expect for the season? How does little Johnny play? How do you, what do you like to see little Johnny do on the court? And what do you like to see teams do on the court? And things like that. Simple, easy questions. And if they come out and say, my son's the best, blah, blah, blah. Then unless that kid is ranked in some way, then that's going to be a red flag. Because now that player may be your sixth or seventh or eighth man. But if that parent's going to be a shit disturber and say that I want my kid to be a starter, he's going to win MVP every single game, then that is a huge red flag to me because for myself, I usually don't stick to the exact same lineup every game. I've got kind of like three, sometimes four players who will be set in stone. These are the best guys on the team. But there's usually like one position or one player where it's like, okay, three guys could fit in there. And it really depends on the team that we're playing. If they've got some taller guys, we could fit this other guy over here. He's a bit taller, agile. He can match their height. Things like that. And if you've got, a, if you've got parents who are like, my kid has to start every single game because I think that he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Then at that point you have an issue and is it worth your time taking that player because you're going to probably have a headache with that parent unless you know for sure that that kid's going to be a set in stone starter and then there's still the issue of uh, if your league or your tournament has MVPs and games and if that kid doesn't win MVP will that parent start screaming and yelling so um, interview the parents interview the players know where their minds the mindset is and then of course look at the skills as well now, after you've got your seven or eight players in mind or on paper, then you start probably dwindling down, most likely. There's very few teams uh, at tryouts who will be able to field 
a team of 12 all-stars. So after you get past your first five, six, seven guys, and you start dwindling down the skills or their mindset or whatever, you've, you're basically filling out your eight, nine, and 10 spot. And I used to be the type of coach that would say, I'm going nine guys, three guys are development, and these nine guys are my main nine guys who go on the court. Today, I'm a bit different. I go starters, 20-ish minutes, next five, 10-ish minutes, and then 11th and 12th man are gonna be development four minutes roughly. I get everyone in onto, the, onto the court, but at that point, I really like to be able to look at the 11th and 12th spot. If you're gonna have players that fill that 11th and 12th spot, not necessarily players who are very extremely good. So for example, let's say you had a strong eight, nine or 10 player lineup. And then you've got like 11th and 12th man who are really good players, but they're not the top 10. Are you willing to take those players, give them very few minutes on the court and maybe cut back their, their development because now sure they're really good players, but now they're sitting on the bench and not getting game action. Are you willing to cut back their development where they could go to a maybe a lower ranked team and become a starter there and get more minutes and of course more development and then turn around and get players who are maybe less skilled for that 11th and 12th spot but highly motivated players and that's what I like to have in the 11th and 12th spot. So if you're a player and you are highly motivated that's a good spot for you because now you understand, okay, I'm not one of the best players. I probably wouldn't make any of the teams out here. And in the 11th and 12th spot, if I'm highly motivated, then I'm going to be in practice working my butt off so that I can crack that top 10. And my goal as a coach is to get that 11th and 12th player by the end of the season in that sixth, seventh, or even eighth spot. And then, because they're highly motivated, maybe potentially next season, they may become a starter if they continue to improve during the off season. That's the type of player I like in the 11th and 12th spot because I can spend extra time with them and push them up and get them into those, those starting roles or those seventh or eighth man spots and sure, there's going to be players who get bumped down because of those players, but now it's making everyone else work harder, and those 11th and 12th players are now motivating everyone else to work harder so that they don't fall down the rotation. It's all about competition. I may be a player first coach, but I love to see competition. I love to see players pushing each other not in the way of saying you suck, blah, 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 but in the way of, hey, I'm getting better. Guess what? I just took your ninth spot. Guess what? I just took your, your sixth spot. Man, you need to start improving so that you, you don't drop too far. Keep on going. Like, work. So those are the types of players I like in the 11th and 12th spot because they're highly motivated. They're some of my favorite players. Because and Yes, I'm a coach and I have favorite players. Ooh, every coach has favorite players. I like all 12 players on my team, but the ones who work hardest are my favorites. Now, that doesn't mean they're getting a ton of minutes. That just means that, hey, if they're working their butt off, they were getting four minutes. Whether they're improving or not, if they're like number one on sprints and number one on, on getting back and number one on everything, they may now get six or eight minutes. Because now, I see them hustling in practice, maybe they'll hustle in game. And if they continue to hustle in game, hustle does a lot. Remember, board man gets paid. Somebody goes out there and grabs 20 rebounds, <laughs> that's highly useful. So, remember, hard work pays off. Anyways, I hope that you've enjoyed today's video. I hope that this has given some information to some coaches, obviously some players as well. If it has, I'll, I'll see you guys again next time. Hit that like button and subscribe.